Coming up on Daily Tech News Show, why the Navy is moving away from touchscreens, why Chrome's incognito mode still can be detected, and using a bog to create electricity. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 12, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about luggage and TSA security and Roger wearing a bathrobe to his own wedding. Uh, if you want to know more about that, by all means, become a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS and get the wider show where we talk about technology and more called Good Day Internet. That's patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Oh, come on. <laughs> India's Reliance Industries announced a partnership with Microsoft Azure. Reliance's Geo will build data centers using Azure to provide things like natural language understandings for all Indian languages and dialects, which is no small feat. There are many of them. Geo will also provide free connectivity and cloud infrastructure to startups, as well as plans for small and medium businesses for as little as 1,500 rupees. That's about $21.05 per month. Researchers at Checkpoint Software demonstrated using the picture transfer protocol over Wi-Fi or USB to install ransomware, that's right, ransomware, on a Canon 80D DSLR and encrypt the images on your SD card to prevent access. Counterpoint and Canon have been working on a patch since May. The researchers said that any cameras using the picture transfer protocol could be vulnerable to a similar attack. After Tyler Blevins, a.k.a. Ninja, left Twitch to move to Mixer, Twitch was using his old Twitch channel to promote other Fortnite players on Twitch. This weekend, a pornography channel managed to get itself at the top of Twitch's Fortnite recommendations and then got promoted to Ninja's old channel, which, as you can imagine, caused some drama. Twitch reverted the page to a standard archival mode. Twitch CEO Emmett Shear said that the offending channel had been suspended and apologized directly to Ninja. You know, sometimes when you get trolly, you get trolled. That just happens. Uh, Samsung's share of the European smartphone market rose from 33.9% last year to 40.6%, mostly on increased sales of mid-range phones like the Galaxy A50, one of their top three sellers in Europe. Xiaomi also grew in Europe by 50% to 9.6% of the market. Everybody else had a harder time. And as promised, Huawei launched a device running its new Hongmeng or Harmony OS, the Honor Vision Smart TV. The 55-inch TV starts at 3,799 won or about US 538. All right, let's talk a little more about uh, image sensor company Samsung has a new product. <laughs> Samsung. It's got a new title every week. Samsung unveiled the Isocell Bright HMX smartphone camera sensor, which offers up to 108 megapixels of resolution. That's a lot. The sensor was developed with Xiaomi and is one of the largest smartphone camera sensors at about three quarters of an inch. By default, the sensor will use pixel binning, combining four pixels into one to capture high quality 27 megapixel images. It's 27 megapixel images. This helps with low light performance. The sensor also has smart ISO, which adjusts the ISO levels to compensate for bright or dim environments. The sensor is also capable of capturing 6K video at 30 frames per second. And production of the new sensor is expected to begin this month. Yeah, 108 megapixels is going to be in all the headlines, but the, the fact that you're getting better low light and light sensitive performance from, from the pixels being used to create a 27 megapixel image is, I think, uh, going to have more of an impact if you get a phone with this sensor in it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if that smart ISO post-processing uh, ends up being as good as it looks, but that, that could be pretty helpful as well. Uh, you know, coming at this from the positive end, you're like, hey, this is a really big sensor for a smartphone, which can do some pretty high quality image capture. But but Roger, when you compare this to actual camera sensors, not that impressive, is it? I, it's 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 up there with upper tier point and shoots, but not premium point and shoots. So you're you're definitely getting a very large sensor for a smartphone, but it is kind of on the small. It is definitely on the small end uh, for cameras. I mean, uh, it's roughly thirty three millimeters. Uh, in, uh, diagonally and comparatively, like if you dealt with a like a Canon uh, uh, APS-C, which is a crop sensor, that you're dealing with 329 millimeters. So you might be asking, well, what's the big deal? The the big deal is that in order to get more sensitivity without having a lot of noise, that kind of green uh, artifacting that you get with your picture, 
uh, you need a larger sensor or you need to turn into a lot of pr post-processing or software uh, uh, processed uh, to kind of eliminate a lot of that noise in the image before it gets to you, the, the end user. So not every phone is going to be able to take advantage of this large of a sensor or, or is going to want to based on its design, uh, but but it would improve the quality of pictures in a lot of smartphones, no? Uh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it depends on how it's implemented, but it does have the the great potential to improve, you know, the, the, the shots that you take with your phone. When you're, you know, for a night on the town or if you're at a, like, you know, special occasion or you just pull it out because you see something really awesome. Um, but again, I think a lot of the, the feature set will be in the post-processing of the image. Well, and that's why they made such yeah. a big deal about that smart ISO yeah. uh, being built in. Uh, that, that means, you know, Huawei does a lot of post-processing, you know, so, so does Android, so does the iPhone. Um, but having it built in on the sensor, you know, takes takes a little bit of the pressure off. It takes off. the pressure off, but it also guarantees, at least ideally, it should guarantee you the same image quality, would, regardless of what manufacturer implements that, uh, yeah, that, right. that camera in the phone. You know, as somebody who used to, I used to really be into digital cameras before our phones were all our digital cameras. You know, I remember when 16 megapixels was like, whoa, that is so cool. Like that's the, that, you know, and it's so small. And there are so many proprietary names for cool sensors. You know, the, the size is size and megapixels are megapixels. But I, 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 I can't be the only one who at this point is like, if it takes good pictures in low light, yeah. great. Yeah. And that's what they're that that's what they're aiming at. They're aiming for the consumer who doesn't want to think about specs, who doesn't want to think about, you know, how how many lumens I can get, how dark it. They just want to be able to press the button. They get a picture that they can share with friends and family. Say, hey, look, we have a birthday photo with grandma. You know, at the night at Chevy's or Chi oh, Chi Chi's went out of business. Uh, pick your favorite restaurant that your family hangs out at, um, and that's all they care about. And if it does that, they're happy. All right, folks, touch screens away. And by away, I mean away from our boats. Uh, the U.S. Navy announced it will revert destroyers from touch screens to mechanical throttle and helm control systems over the next 18 to 24 months. This is because a crash off the coast of Singapore between a Liberian oil tanker and the USS John S. McCain on August 21st, 2017, killed 10 sailors and injured 48. And a comprehensive review by the Navy found that the crew had placed the touchscreens on that destroyer in backup manual mode, removing computer-assisted help because it gave them a, quote, more direct form of communication between steering and the SSC, the, the, the touchscreen console. It also meant, however, that any crew member at another station could take over steering, causing control to shift, in this case, from the lee helm to aft steering to the helm and back to the aft steering, and that's when they lost control of the destroyer. The NTSB found that crews preferred mechanical controls because, quote, they provide both immediate and tactile feedback to the operator, uh, meaning they think they would have caught this situation a lot faster if they had had that tactile feedback. Following safety testing, the first new throttles are scheduled to be installed by summer 2020. The reports did find that fatigue of the crew played a part in this, as well as uh, in... Uh, insufficient training on this particular touchscreen console. Um, this sounds this sounds like a, a, a really uh, a kind of an object lesson and bad user interface. Yeah. Well, and inadequate training. Uh, it, you know, if 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 there was a manual mode that it shouldn't have been in, but but was because it was easier at the time when everything was going well. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's insufficient training too. Or at least I, they should have known how to recover and what the risks of using that manual mode were. Um, Roger, you were saying you found something that uh, implied that these, you worked differently on, on well, different. So the, the interfaces too. aren't the same across all the ships. And so uh, from what I've, from what I understand, like there, there was really no guidance for, for the contractors when they designed these, like all the, all the interfaces, like, you know, in Star Trek, all the helms kind of look the same. They have bars that that navigate, and not the rest. So that was left up to the contractors. And so you basically, as as Sarah was saying, there was not enough training to teach them on this specific system. If there was a more standardized set, then you could kind of train them in the process as they were upcrewing instead of just having it specific to the ship, because there's enough spe ship specific systems that you have to learn. Um, also, you know, if it's too complicated, and I know this from very bad car dashes. 
when you're tired, things that normally you think would be somewhere uh, that aren't there really mm-hmm. frustrate you. And an mm-hmm. emergency can be in- incredibly dangerous. Yeah, you almost have to revert to muscle memory sometimes, you know, the way that you you wouldn't want your touchscreen to be your brake pedal. Yeah, imagine if someone flipped the brake and the gas pedal on your car. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like it's right, right. It's not, you know, it's a little simplistic, but you learn certain things and they're in specific spots and ideally they would have kind of. um, Yeah, I mean, driving in a country that drives on the opposite side of the road of your country while you're jet lagged. (laughs) <laughs> is is can be frightening, right? Because everything's in the wrong place and you're tired. Uh, I say that mm-hmm. from experience driving in Australia last year. So, yeah, this is this this is no joke. Uh, I think it I, I think it means that touchscreens need more work on their design uh, before they are re-implemented. I don't know that it means that mechanical controls will continue to always be preferential. Uh, it, it it just means that you you need to work a lot harder to make them foolproof, literally. Yeah, I guess my my overall feeling is the, the training could have been better, but hey, if we're talking about destroyer ships, well, give 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 the uh, give them what they want. Yeah, it's a big ship doesn't doesn't <laughs> doesn't move quick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> just make it safe. That's what what it takes. Go for it. At the DEF CON voting village, DARPA showed off an open source secure voting machine being designed by Oregon based verifiable systems firm Galois. The chips are being designed as open hardware with no proprietary components in order to make them the basis to a secure hardware platform, which would be useful for IoT. The DARPA machines ran on virtualized hardware this year with a basic interface provided by secure voting firm Voting Works. The machine prints out selections with a QR code for a cryptographic validity check, and DARPA plans to complete systems access at DEF CON in 2020. The system offers a code repository at securehardware.org and plans a small test board as well. Yeah, so usually the voting village, and and this year's no exception, uh, is a place where folks can hack away on election machines to try to find vulnerabilities so they can be fixed in the future. And this one had had the opportunity for people to look for software bugs. In fact, they had an open web server hidden in there on purpose because they said, hey, we want to see if people can find it. And when they do, we think we walled off the rest of the system. So even when they find that server, they can't do damage. But we want to know if that's that's for sure or not. So this is all good stuff. This is making these voting machines more secure. I think even beyond that, uh, the idea of having a platform uh, that is getting this kind of treatment and this kind of focus in the voting village, but could also provide more secure hardware for Internet of Things. Uh, for instance, there was a recent vulnerability in one of the Internet of Things uh, operating systems uh, that you just have to wait for your IoT device maker to fix. Otherwise, you are really at risk and it's impossible for you to really know for sure uh, mm-hmm. the way things are. You want some hardware security in, in these things, and, and that can be a huge benefit for IoT. At least I think so. Agreed. Um, yeah. Uh, looking forward to finding out uh, what this looks like when they bring the actual hardware platform next year. So try and help us remember to check in. And Shannon Morse, our guest tomorrow, uh, who was at DEF CON, is going to give us a great roundup of all the other stuff uh, that she saw and observed there as well. In Chrome 76, Google fixed Chrome's incognito mode. We talked about this on the show before. If you missed it, uh, previously, the Chrome file system API was disabled in incognito mode. So if a site wanted to be able to tell if you were in incognito mode, they would look for that API. If it wasn't there, they would assume you're in incognito mode. Well, to get around this, Chrome 76 now leaves the Chrome file system API enabled so that if you're checking for the file system, it'll be there. And you can't tell if someone's in incognito mode or not from that. However, to preserve privacy, because you don't want that file system sitting on a hard drive afterwards, the file system is using a transient memory file system that's cleared when the session is closed. If you know what a RAM disk is, it's kind of like that. Uh, However, this memory-based transient system leads to two new ways to detect incognito users. Security researcher Vikas Mishra found that incognito allocates a maximum of 120 megabytes of memory to the transient file system. And that's something that would normally only happen if the device storage was less than 2.4 gigabytes, because it's usually based on a scale of relative to what you have on your machine. Uh, So 
knowing that most devices don't have 2.4 gigabytes uh, of device storage, they figured, okay, that's an easy way to tell. If it's 120 megabytes, probably incognito mode. Another method discovered by researcher Jesse Lee measures the speed of writing to the file system because writing to a transient file system in memory is a lot faster than writing to a hard drive. That's why RAM disks are, are so cool because you can write and read from them real fast. Microsoft Edge developer Eric Lawrence notes the New York Times seems to already be using Mishra's code that detects the 120 megabyte file uh, to detect incognito. You can see it in the in the uh, code inspector. Google told Bleeping Computer it will, quote, work to remedy any other current or future means of incognito mode detection. And I'm sure the New York Times and others with paywalls will work to immediately figure out a new way to tell if you're in incognito mode. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you mentioned paywalls. That's the main reason that a publisher or anybody running a site would care whether you're well, in incognito mode or not, reasons. right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but there's all kinds of other like nefarious reasons that people targeting you might might have uh, if they want to build up a dossier of your illicit activities that you're putting in incognito mode, I guess. But yeah, the most common reason that this is going to you're going to run into this is trying to get around a paywall. So it's not necessarily the best, most ethical reason, but there is the principle of when you're in incognito mode, you don't want anybody to be able to tell that. That's right. part of the reason you're using incognito mode. <laughs> you're incognito, supposedly. Yeah. It's supposed to protect your privacy from anything out there, good or bad, right? That's that's kind of the point of it. So this is this is difficult because yes, it's unethical to use it to get around a paywall, uh, but it also is is meant to protect you from legitimate threats. And right now there are two ways to get around that. I, I know folks who are in cognito mode 100% of the time. Yeah, just because they, they, they're like, yeah, I don't need well, any- Like if it's an like, option, why wouldn't I just I always use it? Yeah. You know, exactly. it's not 100% foolproof, but why why not? It's right there. It's just a little, I mean, just a little it, switch. It'll make your life a little less practical because, you you know, there's certain sure. things that, that make life easier when, when a website knows who you are and can mm -hmm. set cookies and all that sort of thing. But right. uh, if that's an option matter, for a reason. Yeah, exactly. Sony announced an updated version of its XAV AX5000, which is an in-car receiver. This one lets drivers at a 9.95 inch floating touchscreen display. It doesn't actually float, but it, it can be adjusted. It needs a single DIN to install. DIN refers to about a two inch by eight inch opening that radios fit into. So the opening needs to be a lot smaller than what the screen will actually oh, be. It. it kind of floats out in front of it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of like a, you know, a TV mount that can tilt and, and, and and go up and down. The display can tilt and adjust the height and depth. It features support for CarPlay and Android Auto through a USB, hands-free voice control, Bluetooth connectivity, and in future updates, will support Abalta's web link platform as well. The display will be available in the US in December for $600. That's hmm. a pretty penny, but it's, it's cheaper than some of the comparable models of these sorts of things. On the car front, Bosch is developing 3D imaging to future versions of its in-car digital displays using passive 3D tech that won't require you to wear glasses or require you as a driver to look from one specific spot. So you're, you know, it's not tracking your eyesight basically, uh, which is actually extremely cool. You have to like, like lean down and look, oh, now I see the 3D, right? Yeah. Right. Where, you know, with, with my own car, I've got a, a, a heads up display. But if I deviate from where my car seat is just a little bit, I can't see my miles per hour, you know, so it's, oh, okay. it's, it's all very, it's, well, uh, there, there have been some TVs with uh, glasses free 3d where it's like, you have to sit in right in front of it. Otherwise it doesn't work. Exactly. So alerts, navigation, parking cameras can all take advantage of this technology when it is available. And we don't have any word on consumer availability at this time. You know, this kind of reminds me of that story you did a couple of weeks ago about how a lot of accidents uh, involving automobiles, uh, drivers and, and their phone wasn't because there was the phone usage, just because they were taking their eyes off the road. Mm. And if you know, if you can implement a system that kept people's eyeballs straightforward and still be able to alert them, that would be great. Because a lot of touchscreens still require you to crank your head over. And then you got to mess with your, you know, mess with it a little bit with your hand in order to get to where you want. And that takes is your. Is that what this 3D display does, though? Well, I mean, because it's still down in the dash to your right. But the way I, the way I understood it is that um, when you looked at it, it wasn't. You didn't need. You could. You uh, being 3D, you would be able to see it slightly. 
not you didn't have to can't can't your head. Maybe I'm misunderstanding the story then, because I thought it was it was designed so that it could present the three D projection a little bit. Yeah, it's not like a heads up display. Oh no, I think, yeah. I, I think what's good about it is you don't have to point your head in the right direction to see the three D, right? And that's so, right. Yeah. That's when, right. Okay, so when you know, so it can do some three D stuff, and you don't have to like position yeah. yourself to see it, but you're still looking down. It's not it's, a, it's not in your field of vision. It's like okay, so my heads up display will. I mean, there's some customization, but it's like I got my miles per hour, and it'll also flash things like school crossing signs just you know if i'm not aware that there's a school coming up it's like 25 miles per hour you know tops yeah. and but that's something that i can only see in one place i could be like briefly looking at you know my uh, passenger side rearview mirror and i could see that alert because that's where i'm looking at that particular moment that's yeah, pretty cool well the, the the 3d display doesn't do that does it i think it just it just points right from your your console down down to your right if i'm looking at this display properly well, no, I mean, you, that's the whole point is that you don't have to be looking in one specific place. Well, no, I, that means I don't have to be the 3d can, I can see the 3d on the screen from any angle. It doesn't mean that the 3d shows up anywhere. I look, oh man, really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thought it was a little cooler uh, than it was. This cool, is so though, cool. Yeah. I can do things like, uh, you know, show you the map that you're looking at in 3d so that you can see clearly like, oh, it's not this turn, it's the next one, stuff like that. Yeah. And, and well, part of the stuff, I think part of what's throwing off is because some of the photos actually show the dash, like the, the instrument dash and not just the screen is also being 3D. So yeah, I, could, I guess you could put it in the in the rear view mirror. You could put, a, put it in a, three, in a heads up display and it would be a little nicer and pop out to you. Um, I mean, you know, it's better than one of those paintings where you actually had to stare at it for a couple of a uh, couple of seconds to actually three, see the effect. Um, but uh, I think uh, f I think 3D is more than just. It, you can set up a system of alerts where, depending on on how 3D it mm -hmm. is, it's more important and less important. It's easier to catch your attention. They also say parking cameras could give you a more accurate 3D view as you're as you're backing into a space. Uh, that kind of stuff. So yeah, the, the the 3D stuff is interesting. That probably not as practical or as as everyday interesting as the Sony uh, thing, where you can get a, an aftermarket yeah. big air, big old touchscreen. Which is right there which, I car. mean, so many there, there are at least four or five companies that have something similar, but not like OEM style. Where hey, this is all the stuff my friend has, and I didn't need to buy a new car. Yeah. All right. And Gadget has an article on using bacteria to generate electricity. Microorganisms called geobacter purify water by consuming waste and then excrete electrons, which can be harvested as energy. Geobacter grow in mud. And biologist, designer, and artist Teresa Van Dongen found a very well-thriving ecosystem of geobacter in a water-filled bomb crater in the Dutch countryside and has created an installation called Mudwell. Van Dongen has placed a telescope-like device with one end in the water and the other end out where a viewer can look through it and see a light display oscillate powered by the geobacter. Now, she's worked with geobacter before, but she usually needs to give it vinegar for fuel, whereas the mud well has enough geobacter growing that it's self-sustaining. Wow. First of all, vinegar for fuel. Okay, I got a yeah. lot of that in my kitchen. Uh, but uh, this is this is so incredibly cool um, as as not just you know some sort of an art installation, but but an actual you know thinking ahead. It, I don't know the all of the mud that we avoid for the most part for this to actually be contributing to electricity in some form that would would serve a lot of folks at some points is is really cool. Yeah, I, you know, I love this idea that an art institute, it's being it's being funded as an art installation, uh, is bringing to light haha, uh, <laughs> the idea that, hey, you know what, you know, we've known that Geobacter exists and we've known that that they provide a little bit of power, but we've never really seen it at scale. And she has worked with it enough that she's like, this is the, the, the biggest electrical output of any Geobacter I've ever worked with. You know, the fact that I don't have to give it any fuel yeah. uh, it means that it's self-sustaining and it, you know, granted 
I don't know how practical it is to go around and, you know, dig out bomb crater size holes and fill them up with water, hoping a bog of Geobacter, you know, trying to see to what Geobacter is. Uh, but it's certainly worth investigation. And it's nice to see art bringing our attention to something that then can be investigated for that. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of lowland areas where you would think that this kind of micro or microorganism would be thriving in other parts of the world as well. Yeah, and we're always looking for new battery tech too, right? Like who knows if, if, if maybe after some, some more research is applied to Geobacter, and I'm not trying to imply that there isn't a lot of research on Geobacter going on right now, but maybe if it gets a few more eyes on it, we start to figure out uh, and how to make biological batteries. And then suddenly those, those battery issues we have with lithium ion batteries, which we've been stuck with for decades now, um, finally gets replaced. Maybe not, you know, maybe this isn't it either, but I'm always fascinated by that. And if nothing else, it's, it's a way to show that there are, there are a lot more power sources out there to be explored than just the typical solar, uh, coal, oil, et cetera, mm -hmm. and wind. I don't, I don't know if this is going to work for me, though. We don't get enough water. I'm probably have to stick with solar here. Yeah, we don't have enough bogs in L.A. We're bog deficient. Yes, we yeah. are. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You help us choose our stories every day. Keep it up. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't already. Facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right, let's move on to Chris Christensen. The amateur traveler has some fairly big news for those of us who fly Southwest and also like a good deal. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. I don't know if you know, but not all budget airlines are listed in the online search engines like Expedia. The one in the U.S. that is most noticeably missing is Southwest Airlines. Southwest has never allowed their flights to be listed. And as someone who used to be the director of engineering at TripAdvisor flights, let me tell you that this announcement that they're now going to let them be listed on two different backend systems is a hell freezes over kind of moment. Moment. You probably haven't heard of Travelport and Amadeus, but they're used at the back end of some of the online flight search engines. This will happen in 2020, and it means that as you're searching for your flight, you'll find Southwest flights along with the other flights. And that will give you a better booking experience. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, every flight search I did was uh, everything and then Southwest. And Southwest. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and did. then it was Expedia and Southwest or yeah. Kayak and Southwest, whatever I was using at the time. Right. Yeah. Uh, still is to a large extent, although Southwest doesn't always fly to the places that I, I need to direct. Uh, and I, I like to, to, you know, as I get older, put a little more emphasis on the direct flight, but this is great to know. This is, this is, like you said, is a hell freezes over minute, right? Yeah, it I, I I it had been such a part of my looking at flight experience. I I stopped feeling inconvenienced by it. It was like, oh yeah, and let's also look at Southwest. <laughs> yeah, it just becomes a muscle battery. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Mick in Australia weighed in on our Friday discussion with Raj Dayut on satellite internet in Australia. What's good? What isn't good? And Mick says for him, it's not a speed issue so much as data caps and restricted timing. Mick says satellite broadband prices are high in comparison to fixed wired or wireless NBN. A small amount of monthly data is allocated and is then further split into peak and off peak. Off peak gets the lion's share of the allotted data, but that's from like 1 a.m. in the morning to 7 a.m. in the morning. $135 a month for 150 gigabytes. 130 gigabytes of that is off peak. 15 gigabytes at peak. So 15 gigabytes to do homework or to use social media or to watch Netflix and other streaming. It's just not possible. Prior to Sky Muster, Nick says being launched, we had NBM satellite on even worse plans, 80 gigabytes per month for $90. That's what he paid with peak and off peak times. It was stressful having to watch the data limits every day to make sure the kids could do their homework. Prior to that, Australia had what was called ABG, Australian Broadband Guarantee, again, satellite-based, and only about 30 gigabytes per month for $80. Mick finally says there are only really two options, even though he lives five kilometers outside the center of his nearest town. Satellite, we're faking our address so we can get a 4G modem. We have to use external antennas for, only available in certain locations, very limiting. Nick says, we finally feel like we can use the internet for fun now with this new plan for 500 gigabytes per month of data, which was a recent upgrade. 
Yeah, no matter what you talk about, there's always somebody left out. Uh, so Mick, thank you for for sharing that that perspective with us. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Also, thanks to all of our listeners. Without you, we would be nothing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, in fact, I want to meet some of you. If you're going to be in Dublin, Saturday, August 17th, that's this Saturday at 6 p.m. Dublin time, uh, come on by Laguna. Laguna is right in front of the Mayor Square NCI stop on the Lewis Red Line. Uh, you can go to laguna.ie if you want to find out more information on how to find them. Uh, but uh, thanks to Paolo for helping me uh, figure this out. And uh, let us know, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com if you plan to come, because uh, we want to get an estimated count. Uh, I know of a couple people who are coming for sure. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, it also means that I will not be on Daily Tech News Show but for starting tomorrow for a week and a half, well, two weeks, basically, uh, I'll be back on, on the 26th. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm going to be going to Worldcon for sword and laser, uh, covering the, the Worldcon, uh, which is where they give the Hugo awards for science fiction books out. Uh, and then I'm taking a little vacation and then I'm coming back. So, uh, do come meet me in Dublin again, Saturday, August 17th at 6 PM and everybody else like Sarah said, thank you for supporting us. We have uh, a very small uh, independent operation here, but we're able to do bigger and bigger things like those bonus episodes we did this weekend about Amazon Ring and their issues, about Libra and the reality behind it, because you are our bosses uh, and you were the people we're answerable to. So if that makes sense to you, come and support us at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you're excited for Sarah and Roger and all our fabulous contributors to keep the ship afloat while Tom is on vacation and doing his meetups, well, write us. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow will be Shannon Morris with them. I'll talk to you on the 26th. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>